the coastal redwoods of California are the tallest trees in the world. Regularly reaching heights over 300 feet, these giants tower over the coastal regions of Northern California. The tallest of them all that we know of is a tree named Hyperion, whose crown tops out nearly 380 feet over the forest floor, and whose location is a carefully guarded secret for fear of vandalism. The massive height of these trees almost seems too good to be true. In some cases, you can't even see the top while standing on the ground. But there is a reason, several reasons, why coastal redwoods grow so tall. First, let's talk about where they even are. They're the coastal redwoods of California, so obviously you'll find them on the coast of California. But more specifically, you'll find them in a narrow band along the coast of Northern California. Their range stretches about 470 miles from Monterey County in the south to just over the Oregon border in the north. Crucially though, you'll never find them more than 50 miles inland. The crucial set of conditions which leads to their massive height ensures that they hug that coastline nice and tight. And yeah, let's just dive right into those conditions, because it's not really one single thing which allows the redwoods to grow so tall. As with many superlative natural phenomenon, it's a combination of factors which all come together in just the right way to produce something spectacular. In this case, the tallest trees in the world. Also, I just want to throw it out there that surprisingly, the science isn't all the way settled on this. Like, we have a pretty good idea, and to me, the things we're going to talk about when taken in combination make a lot of sense, but there's still a teeny bit of uncertainty here when we pull it all together. So just keep that in mind. All right, factor number one. This one is kind of cheating a bit, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that one of the reasons redwoods can grow so tall today is literally because they're not being chopped down anymore. Redwoods can survive a lot of things, but a chainsaw is not one of them. Starting in the 1850s, redwood logging became extensive. Of the 2 million acres of redwood forests that were around back then, only 5% of the ancient old growth remains today. Luckily though, most of that 5% is under some form of protection, either federal or state. Now, of course, many of the largest redwoods alive today grew tall long before we put some lines down on a map. Like, these things can live over 2,000 years, and our intervention had nothing to do with them growing as tall as they did. But for the redwood seedlings of today, our intervention gives them a fighting chance. With their habitat protected, they'll be able to take advantage of all the things we're about to talk about, and maybe in another 2,000 years, they'll be the ones whose tops we can't see from the ground. Okay, now let's talk about the actual things that allow them to grow to massive heights. The second factor is a series of factors I like to call self-defense. Remember that redwoods can live to be more than 2,000 years old, and just by playing the numbers game, the older you are, the longer you have to grow. The longer you have to grow, the taller you can become. But you can't grow very old if you don't have good defenses. Take humans, for example. As we grow older, our bodies start to break down and our immunity wanes, so we can't fight off diseases and infections as well. Redwoods don't really have this problem. They have really thick, really tough bark, and their branches are really high up in the air, so for disturbances like fire, only the biggest and most destructive ones really stand a chance of harming a redwood. That bark is also full of chemical compounds known as tannins, which insects and fungus don't like. So they're fairly resistant to things like pests, disease, and rot. With these defenses, redwoods just give themselves a chance, right? Like, by protecting themselves against things that typically kill trees, they're giving themselves the chance to grow for a long time, which means they're giving themselves the chance to grow taller. If you've seen my video on giant sequoias, a lot of this might seem familiar. Now, when you combine this propensity for growing old with the next factor, this is when we start to really see why redwoods grow so tall. That factor is fog. 
To talk about why fog is so important to redwoods, we first need to take a step back and talk about how plants work, like all plants. This is pretty oversimplified, but in general, plants absorb water in the soil through their roots, move it up through their trunks or stems, and lose it through their leaves. That process of losing water through their leaves is called transpiration, and it's basically like plant sweating. Some of that water gets used for like metabolic functions, of course, but most of it, 95%, is lost through transpiration. This is really important because transpiration is basically how plants move water from their roots to their leaves. They don't have a pump like we do. We humans have hearts, and hearts are pumps, and our hearts pump all of the things we need to stay alive throughout our body. Plants do not have pumps, so in order to move all the things they need to stay alive, like water, throughout their bodies, they just rely on good old-fashioned physics and chemistry. When water transpires out of a plant's leaf, this creates a pressure gradient all the way from that leaf down to the roots. So, as that water leaves the leaf, it's now at a more negative pressure than the water in the roots. And water wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, so it moves from the roots up toward the leaves, evaporates, and this process continues. Now, water has a special quality which makes all of this possible. Water is very sticky, like it adheres to itself really well. So when this pressure gradient is created from the leaves to the roots, it puts the water in a plant under a state of tension. Think of a rubber band. It's this state of tension that allows water to essentially be pulled up from the roots to the leaves. And because water sticks to itself really well, you can pull that rubber band really tight and it's not going to break. At some point though, it will break. And this is one of, if not the defining factor in limiting how tall trees can grow. The taller you get, the more tension your water is under. If you get too tall, that tension will break. You will lose your ability to transport water and you will die. Fear not though, because trees have some good ways of combating this. One of these ways is they can close what are called their stomata. Those are the little pores water escapes through during transpiration. If you close your stomata, water can't escape, tension is maintained, everything is fine. But there is a trade-off here. If you close your stomata, you can no longer capture carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide enters the leaves the same way that water leaves the leaves through the stomata. And carbon dioxide is what plants use to do photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is what enables plants to grow. If you don't open your stomata, you're not photosynthesizing. If you're not photosynthesizing, you're not growing. All plants have to reckon with this trade-off, and it's one of the reasons water availability is so important to plant growth. Close the stomata and preserve the water, but forgo photosynthesis and growing bigger. Or open the stomata and photosynthesize, but lose a ton of water. If they choose to close their stomata and forgo photosynthesis, they will not grow. And naturally, this limits the height to which plants can grow. Think about like desert plants. The reason you don't see really tall trees in a desert is because there's no water in a desert. And so if trees open their stomata to photosynthesize, they just lose all their water without being able to easily replace it. And then they basically shrivel up and die. So these two things go hand in hand. Access to water means you can photosynthesize more, basically. And thanks to fog, redwoods have that steady supply of water year round. See where redwoods grow along the Northern California coast? It's pretty rainy most of the time. The area gets something like 100 inches of rain a year. Most of that rain falls in the fall, winter, and spring. So redwoods aren't really stressed for water during this time. They can throw open those stomata, capture a lot of CO2, photosynthesize, and keep on growing nice and tall. They don't really have to worry about losing a bunch of water and threatening that tension in their water column. But during the summer, there's not a lot of rain in this area. And normally, for a tree like a redwood with its massive water requirements, this would be a time to hunker down, close the stomata, conserve water, and wait for the rain to come back. Forgo growth in favor of water conservation. But they don't have to, because instead of rain in the summer, this area gets a lot of fog. Finally, we get back around to 
the fog. Fog helps redwoods avoid water stress in the summertime in a couple of ways. For one, when fog comes into contact with redwood leaves, water condenses on those leaves and drops onto the forest floor, where the redwoods take it up through their roots, basically just like rainfall. Other forest plants take advantage of this too, it's why redwoods are so important for their local forest ecosystems. Other studies have shown too though that redwoods are able to capture water directly from fog through their leaves and store it. Both of these mechanisms have the same effect. They reduce the redwoods need to close their stomata to conserve water. Fog makes water readily available during the otherwise rainless summers. Some estimates say redwoods can get up to 50% of their moisture from fog in the summer. This means redwoods can keep those stomata open, which means they can keep on photosynthesizing, which means they can keep on growing tall. The importance of this type of habitat and these types of conditions, both the rain and the fog, can't be overstated. These are crucial to the massive height of redwoods. I mean, there's a reason their range is so narrow. These conditions just don't occur in that many places. It's another reason why protecting their habitat through state and national parks is so important. But you can start to see how through a combination of factors, redwoods might grow as tall as they do. The environment they live in provides them with ample water year round through rain and fog, so they don't have to worry about water conservation as much, which means they can focus on photosynthesizing and they can focus on growing. Combine that with the redwoods' propensity for self-defense and long life, and that just gives them a lot of time to grow. So not only do they grow a lot, but they grow a long time. It's a good recipe for growing tall. They overcome the obstacles that normally limit how tall trees can grow, which is why they're the tallest trees on Earth. Now, I want to qualify this by saying that there is an upper limit to how tall redwoods can grow. Like, they don't just keep on growing forever, even with these favorable conditions. Current estimates place the maximum height a redwood could possibly grow to at around 427 feet almost 50 feet taller than Hyperion, the tallest tree in the world today. Another question mark on redwood growth is climate change, and whether or not it will increase or decrease the amount of fog in Northern California, which would, of course, impact the redwoods. The jury is still out on this one, and only time will tell the ultimate fate of the redwoods. There are resources in the description if you want to learn more about that. And yeah, that's, that's redwoods. That's why redwoods grow so tall. Probably. Again, the jury is still out on this, so I presented the best evidence for you here. There's more links in the description if you want to dive into the nitty gritty on some of these things. A lot of stuff on plant physiology, if that's your thing. Also, if you're new here, this is National Park Diaries, and I tell stories from the world's protected places. So videos just like this one, where I help you learn about parks and protected areas. I talk about ecology, biology, geology, natural history, cultural history, pretty much anything having to do with a protected area, I'll cover it. If you want more of these stories, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you're interested in supporting more of what I do here, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash nationalparkdiaries. You can get like three extra videos a month over there, plus this one that you're watching right now early and ad free. And I have a Discord, so yeah, check it out if you are willing and able. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.